Bibliophiles of the internet, my name is Audrey and today I'm here to bring you my June wrap up. June was another month that seemed to last a lifetime and the struggle continues. I will still have links down below for ways you can help or things you can do depending on who you are and what you have, so be sure to check out those. In June I did a couple of cool things. My interview with Alicia Dow is now available to watch. I was also part of a non-binary live show on Taz's channel around mid-June and I also got to interview Mason Deaver for Quarantine Pages and working on that will be my next project. I also got to accidentally host Booktube Virtual Pride here on Perpetual Pages. It was supposed to be on Alex Alex's channel. He organized everything and brought us all together, but we had to move it here because of technical stuff last minute. Captions for that are actually available by the time you see this, and Jesse also invited me to co-host the MB Book Club for the month of June, and that discussion post should also be up by the time you see this. And at the risk of sounding like I'm up my own ass, this channel also hit 8,000 subs, so thank you so much for that. I'm still just trying to process. So yeah, everything I just mentioned that has a link will be included downstairs. June, of course, was Pride Month, so I read queer stuff. I shouldn't have to say that, right? The first week of June was the Queer Lit Readathon, and there was also an impromptu 48-hour queer round of Blackathon, which I took part in as well, so let's just get into it. The first book I read for the Queer Lit Readathon was An Absolutely Remarkable Thing by Hank Green. I forgot to take note of the narrator, but I used my library to listen to the audiobook. It's a contemporary sci-fi story about a recent college graduate, April May, who stumbles across this strange statue in New York City and decides to film a video about it, which ends up going viral overnight. Turns out this statue is one of many all across the world that has suddenly appeared without warning and no one knows how they got there or what their purpose is and as the person who first discovered these carls april finds herself as the national spokesperson and her life is turned upside down as the mystery surrounding the carls becomes more and more curious also if you're wondering how this story is queer april is bi as heck and that's like the least interesting thing about this story actually content warnings for multiple assassination attempts references to terrorist attacks incurred homophobia and bi erasure and some graphic injury and violence. This is like a bizarrely delightful combination of weird sci-fi, comedy, fictional memoir, and mystery all in one book. The uniqueness of this story is what really struck me about it because I've read a lot of sci-fi in my life, but none that's as curiously funny and strange as this. And obviously Hank Green has quite a bit of insight to offer about social media fame and recognition, and that's what makes April May such a fascinating character because she is flawed, she is entitled, she's reckless, and she is willing to burn it all down for the smallest chance of audience engagement. And as far as alien invasion stories go, this one's really different because the Carls are not hostile, they're not attacking, they're not doing much of anything besides standing there, and they've actually hidden a bunch of easter eggs and puzzles meant to encourage humans to figure them out. That was also really cool to see April and her team reaching out to internet experts and people from around the world to figure out these clues because there are experiences, contexts, and perspectives that they could never recognize as Americans, much less understand. So it was really cool to see this collective effort. But more than anything else, I think this story is an examination of how humans respond to things they don't understand. When there's no directive and there's no narrative, what does the narrative become? What kind of ideas and assumptions do we project onto constructs that can't respond back? How do we decide who gets to control the narrative and who doesn't? And is that why the Carls sort of chose April to be their conduit? Because she's a young, white, traditionally palatable person who's allowed by societal circumstances to reach the biggest audience. The story asks all of those questions and it's really interesting to think about. I was just gripped from beginning to end and the audiobook is hilarious and fantastic and perfectly narrated as well, so I definitely recommend that. I just love this so much and I gave it five stars. After that, I listened to All Boys Aren't Blue by George M. Johnson, read by the author themselves. It's a self-described memoir manifesto about George's life growing up as a queer black boy, their relationship to their family and their grandmother, their coming of age in college, and how all of that eventually molded them into a journalist and activist. Content warnings for references to molestation and sexual assault, homophobia, racism, use of the n-word and homophobic slurs, and some descriptions of physically painful sex. I mentioned this book in my video about renaming myself, so I feel like you know where I stand with it. I don't know if I can really review it in the way it deserves because it's so close because of that. There's so much truth and there's so much honesty and vulnerability in this memoir that I feel like I highlighted and annotated the entire book. What I love most about this memoir is that it's completely divorced from the white cishet gaze. This was not written to enlighten or to educate non-queer people. It is very much written for 
young queer POC folks, specifically young queer Black folks. It just feels like George is talking directly to their audience, walking us through what they've realized about their queerness and how deeply it's tied to their Blackness. And it is such an offering for young queer folks. It's about how the assignment of their masculinity was informed by their experience of Blackness. It's about detangling otherness from queerness and moments of joy and affirmation from moments of loss. I would describe this book as being a hand outstretched to young queer folks who are still trying to figure out what it means to be themselves. Like I said, I think you know how I feel about this book. It's amazing, it's brilliant, it's tender, it's thoughtful, and it was an obvious five stars. And the last thing I read for the Queer Lit Readathon was volume two of Check Please by Ngozi Okazu. This is the conclusion to the Check Please comic series. It's a queer sports comic about freshman Eric Biddle, aka Biddy, who is a former figure skater, amateur baker, and well-known vlogger on the internet. When he starts college, he decides to try out for the school hockey team, which is unlike anything he's ever done, and there he meets the broody yet attractive team captain Jack. This second volume follows them as Jack has graduated from college and is now a professional hockey player, while Biddy is trying to graduate himself and figure out his own life content warnings for incurred homophobia, inferences to homophobic slurs, and explorations of challenges incurred due to closet culture and prematurely coming out. I don't have too much to say about this because when I think about it, my brain is just shouting, I love it, I love it, I love it. I mean, I don't even have to say this, but this comic is really fun and really sweet, and I find it endlessly fascinating the way the story explores the dynamic of how power and softness intersect. It's always been interesting to me how hockey is perceived to be this very masculine, very physical contact sport. But then you have someone like Biddy who doesn't exactly fit that profile, but he's still very much in the mix. But the story is also largely about the college experience and how we navigate and maintain friendships and relationships that are constantly changing as new freshmen come in and other people graduate. This final installment definitely confronts the angst of trying to figure out your life and trying to authentically be yourself, but it still delivers on the humor, the hopefulness, and the romance. I love Check Please, and I'm never not gonna love Check Please, so this was just another obvious five stars. Then because this author was going to be on quarantine pages, I read The Henna Wars by Adiba Jayagadar, read by Priya Ayar. This is an own voices, queer contemporary story about Nishat, a young queer Bangladeshi Muslim teen who's just come out to her traditional parents as a lesbian, and it did not go great. On top of that, her school is hosting this competition where students can open and operate their own businesses, and her idea to open a henna business is stolen from under her nose by an old friend who may or may not be Nishat's long lost crush. Content warnings for incurred racism, Islamophobia, xenophobia, homophobia, bullying, and forced outing of a queer character in public. I love this so much. At its heart, I think it's really about Nishat confronting ignorance and pain from people in places she once thought of as safe, and how the people closest to us are the ones who can often hurt us the most. I like that the story really sits in these complicated relationships and shows Nishat figuring out how to navigate that within the people she loves and learning how to bring those relationships out of that, which we don't see nearly enough of in YA books. The experience of her coming out to her traditional Bangladeshi Muslim family was also extremely nuanced because her parents had no idea what to do with her or what to say to her, so most of the time they just completely ignore it. That is very true to my own experience as a queer brown person where your family might not disown you or hate you, but they don't know how to support you either, so they just sort of land in this gray space. I really appreciate that because we get a lot of white coming out stories where your family cries but then they love you or they disown you on the spot and there's rarely ever anything in between so getting to see that was a really nice change of pace. Cultural appropriation is also a huge topic in this story, obviously, and it really rang true to me because Nishat really starts doubting herself as the competition gets serious, even though when it comes to henna, she literally has the most background and the most experience. That felt real to me because people of color are instilled with this instinct to count ourselves out, and we start believing that other people can somehow represent our cultures better than we can, or if not better, at least to a more receptive audience, which sucks. It's empowering to see Nishat realize that her lived experiences and her authenticity is her superpower and how that's what's going to give her an edge. And as you can imagine, that aspect of cultural appropriation is what makes Nishat's relationship with Flavia so challenging and so imperfect. And it's nice to see Flavia realizing how she's impacting Nishat and having to learn from that before their relationship can really have a chance. 
This was just a really wonderful story overall and I gave it four and a half stars. After that I listened to Felix Ever After by Case and Calendar read by Logan Rosos. I actually made a Five Reasons to Read video about this book which I deeply deeply love and if you want to know all of my thoughts that will be included down below so definitely check that out. And I also forgot to mention that if you can access it you should absolutely listen to the audiobook because it slaps. This is for sure a new all-time favorite and I gave it five stars. Then I was sent an arc of Finding Joy by author Adriana Herrera which also happened to work for Read Caribbean just like Felix Ever After. After did so I read that next. This actually came out on June 23rd. It's an own voices queer Afro-Latinx adult romance about a Dominican American relief worker named Desta Joy Walker who's just now traveling to his father's homeland of Ethiopia for the first time as part of his job and there he meets a very handsome fellow relief worker and travel guide named Elias. They begin to work in the field together quite a bit and get to know each other but it's also not exactly the safest to be publicly queer in Ethiopia so Desta is trying to work through his own stuff and also trying to assess whether it's worth it to pursue this possibly romantic connection. Content warnings for explorations of being closeted and living in a society where it's not safe to be open about queerness, some homophobia, some instances of xenophobia witnessed by the characters, and some descriptive scenes containing sex. This is such a soft, beautiful, fulfilling romance, which is just what Adriana Herrera does. To give you an example of this dynamic, obviously Desta and Elias can't come out to each other outright, so because they're doing a lot of long commutes, Desta suggests that they listen to the audiobook of Aristotle and Dante as they drive as a way to subtly open a dialogue about queerness, and it is so unbelievably soft. But there's also really interesting internal things happening as well, especially with Desta who feels conflicted because he does really important work that helps a lot of people, but he's not sure if it brings him a sense of happiness and fulfillment. So it becomes this question of whether doing good and necessary work is the same thing as discovering and living out your purpose, and how we make space to prioritize our own desires and needs. They're both dealing with past relationship trauma as well, and they're both working on trusting each other and trusting their connection Action, which is almost a foreign experience for both of them. And overall, it's just a really satisfying romance. I love this book. I love this author. I will read anything she writes. And I gave this one four and a half stars. Then it was The Queer Blackathon. And the first thing I listened to was Pet by Akweke Amezi, read by Christopher Myers. It's an own voices magical story about a young nonverbal trans girl named Jam who's living in a world where monsters allegedly no longer exist. That's what she was always told. But when she accidentally cuts herself on the canvas of one of her mom's paintings, the creature in the painting comes to life and tells Jam there's a monster in her best friend's house that they need to hunt. Content warnings for allusions to child abuse, impossible molestation, and some descriptions of blood, injury, and violence. This story is eerily relevant for how we're currently navigating and confronting systemic racism and even the current pandemic because it's about how monsters do not cease to exist just because we close our eyes and refuse to look. Jam has always grown up being told that these angels from the past defeated all the monsters and that monsters no longer exist and that's what makes it so hard for her to believe this creature, Pet, when it tells her that she and her friend are in very real danger. But if she doesn't see that danger for what it is, her friend could fall victim to it. When we cannot see see and name the things that harm us, that creates a reality where it's easier for those things to continue harming us. I also wanted to say that even though the story is not at all about Jam's queerness, I love seeing the casual transness. There is a discussion about how she has a hormone implant and has undergone SRS and her parents are super supportive about it and we definitely need more stories where queer black youth especially have good support systems. But overall I think the story is almost about feeling resentful about how you're constantly expected to fight when you just want to live, and how easy it would be to retreat into what's comfortable at that moment and act like nothing is happening when so many people don't have the luxury of doing that. This was phenomenal and I cannot wait to read more from Akweke Amezi. I gave this one five stars. After that, I read a short story called Blood is Another Word for Hunger by River Solomon. It's a speculative own voices story about a young slave in the South who kills all her slave owners, but that choice disrupts the spirit world and as a way for the spirits to restore the balance, she is made to give birth to as many people as she kills. These children are like restored spirits from a purgatory space and as they pass from the spirit world to the human world, they are given new life. And 
and it's just about all of them trying to make a life in this place haunted by pain and trying to figure out what they want for themselves. Content warnings for allusions to murder, graphic descriptions of childbirth, suicide ideation, and a graphic suicide attempt. I don't have much to say about this because it is so short, but I found this to be a striking, fascinating story that explores spiritual magic in really interesting ways. I like this really literal take on resurrecting the past and how necessary yet traumatic that can be, and I also appreciate how this story asks, when your life is not your own, where does your ambition go? How do you begin to parse your own desires? It's about the ways the world tries to make us believe that the things we want, no matter how mundane or grandiose, are out of our reach, which only makes us more hungry for those things. I did have questions about the FF relationship in here because I don't think we know the main character's age, but her love interest is described as a teenager, and again, we don't know if she's like an older teenager or what, but either way, I wouldn't fully be on board with that. But overall, River Solomon is an amazing writer, and it was really great to see something different from them, so I gave this one four stars. The last thing I read for that weekend was Homie by Denez Smith, read by the author themselves. I have wanted to read this poetry collection for quite some time. I love Inez Smith and all their work. This collection explores how friendship and connection can be a saving grace in a world that often feels defined by bigotry, hatred, and violence. Content warnings for use of racial and homophobic slurs, albeit in the context of reclamation, allusions to police brutality and racism, and explorations of grief and loss. You know Dinez Smith is a born poet because they can take language that's everyday, the kind of language people use when they don't have to put on a facade and they're not trying to impress anyone, like the polar opposite of the phone voice, and they take that and they make it into poetry. It is the wildest form of alchemy, and I love it. Their work is so accessible and really digs into your soul because you're not expected to do all this extra work and unpack all these pretentious layers, which is not to say their work isn't nuanced and layered, it is, but language is not used as a barrier to entry. It is used to welcome the reader into the work. This collection is an homage to friendship and love. It's an exploration of how we celebrate and love on the friends we have, how we cherish the unique things they bring to our lives, but it's also a critique of all the systems in place that take our friends away from us or put our friends in early graves. It's about all the relationships that have been lost not because of choice but because of chance and all the ways the world and culture influences and contextualizes our relationships. It's about all the ways the world tries to make our life and our love seem small when actually they are giant. I don't have the words to describe all the ways this collection succeeds. It's angry, it's funny, it's filthy, it's electric, it's incredible, and I gave it five stars. Then I read my digital arc of The Summer of Everything by Julian Winters. This comes out on September 8th. It's an own voices, queer contemporary story about Wes Hudson, a bona fide comic geek and indie bookseller who would be having a great summer if he didn't have to figure out college stuff and make adult life choices. As if that wasn't bad enough, he and his coworkers hear that the bookstore where they work might be bought out from under them by a corporate coffee franchise if they can't find a way to save it. Wes's annoying older brother is also harping him for wedding advice, and Wes may or may not be in love with his best friend, so he has a lot going on. Content warnings for some descriptions of anxiety and panic attacks, mentions of parental death of a supporting character, and for some references to terminal illness and its effects. This book is awesome. It's more of what Julian Winters does best, which is telling heartwarming stories about friendships and learning to face the future when you don't have all the answers and learning to be okay with that. I love that this story challenges the idea that adults have control and know what they're doing because most of the time we don't. And it also really lives in that gray area that most teenagers occupy where they're too young to be taken seriously, but still somehow old enough to know what's good for themselves. Wes puts it best in the story when he says, says, I'm adult enough for expectations, but not adult enough to know what I want. Wes is terrified of what he doesn't know, and that's why he really clings to things like the bookstore, his friends, how in love he is with his best friend Nico, because these are things he understands and he cares about the most. The story is about this instinct to stick to what's familiar and comfortable as a safety blanket instead of a safe haven, and how we can only grow and change when we challenge ourselves and dive headfirst into discomfort. As the story goes on, 
on, Wes is learning that he has to let the future happen to him because it's real and it's unavoidable, so he can either succumb to it or be the one to shape it. Like I said, this is more of what Julian Winters does best, found family, awesome group dynamics, incredible banter and humor, nostalgic summer fun, inclusivity, and a super sweet romance. I absolutely loved it and I gave it four and a half stars. Then for the NB Book Club, I listened to The Future of Another Timeline by Annalie Newitz. It's another own voices, queer sci-fi, time traveling story split between the 90s and the 2020s about this group called the Daughters of Harriet who are trying to create a safer future and secure human rights by traveling back to key points in history to make what are called edits. The problem is they suspect there's a misogynistic men's rights group following closely behind them and making edits of their own and this opposing group could be close to figuring out how to lock the time stream and make those harmful edits permanent. This one's pretty intense so there's content warnings for mentions of rape, slavery, misogyny, anti-semitism, racism, descriptions of child abuse and molestation, descriptions of pedophilia, allusions to suicide, graphic depictions of abortion and murder, instances of transphobia, some extremely graphic violence, and some drug use. I'm a little torn about this one because on one hand, stylistically, aesthetically, narratively, I was on board. I was vibing with it. It just felt so emblematic of punk rock and made me think about how music so often influences social attitudes and even social movements because it can come to embody the voice of generations and how all of those things influence music right back. I actually studied a bit about the history of rock music when I was in college, so I was for sure nerding out about that aspect. I also enjoyed how the time travel mechanic is so deeply rooted in scientific and historical nuance. I feel like the author has a really good understanding of those things, and that's what makes the timey-wimey stuff feel plausible and realistic. I also thought the POV split was very well thought through because one of the storylines is much more heavy-handed with the time traveling aspect, which can get complicated, but the other storyline is much more mundane and grounded in the coming of age experience. I was also drawn to this idea of being haunted by things that have been taken away from you without you ever knowing it, which is what happens when travelers make these edits. It can erase entire relationships and experiences. It really drives home the idea that not being able to access your own history is an act of violence, and that when we don't understand history, we are missing a part of ourselves. What I didn't like was that this feminist group of characters was made up of women and non-binary folks, which is a troubling categorization because it will always imply that non-binary people are female light or that they are associated with womanhood when we are not. It also brings about some concerning issues with the name Daughters of Harriet. There were no men or mask or trans mask people involved in the ranks either, and it's not just about men, it's that I would have liked to see people of all genders getting to be a part of this fight. The story also gave me a lot of white feminism vibes in a lot of ways, firstly because the Daughters of Harriet are named after Harriet Tubman, but there are only a few POC from what I remember, and also because the issues they're fighting for felt very US and Western centric when injustice has has no borders. Those were my issues and I think a lot of people are going to read this and never think about those things, which is fine, but I cannot unsee them, which is why I gave this about three and a half stars. Afterwards, I picked up Meet Cute Club by Jack Harbin. It's an own voices queer adult romance about Jordan who runs a small romance book club and loves every second of it, and one day when he's at a local indie bookshop buying the books for his club's next meeting, he runs into a new bookseller who is not as impressed with his literary selections. The new employee is Rex, and he's always thought that romance is for stuffy old ladies who are unsatisfied and who cling to unrealistic expectations of happiness, but this of course enrages Jordan who tells Rex to educate himself and mind his own damn business. This fiery passion for romance stories that Jordan has oddly entices Rex who decides to join the book club to see what this fuss over romance is really about. Content warnings for allusions to death of a grandparent, allusions to alcohol and drug abuse, mentions of parental infidelity ending in divorce, mentions of child neglect and emotional and verbal abuse, some mentions of off-the-page homophobia, and descriptive scenes containing sex. What I really enjoyed about this story was the dynamic between Jordan and Rex. It's definitely not hate to love because there's no real hate to begin with, but I did appreciate how Rex was skeptical at first, but at the same time open to having his mind be changed by Jordan's passion for romance stories. When they first meet at the bookstore, he is definitely judging Jordan, and I like that he joins the book club not to prove to Jordan that he's mistaken about romance, but because Jordan's enthusiasm for romance convinces him that he might be missing something, and that's a really important distinction to make. And there's also a ton of instances showing us that you can be kind and supportive of things you don't understand or things you don't enjoy yourself without being a jerk. That simple truth is all over this book. 
It's also just nice to see how they start to connect over these stories and these book club meetings and how Rex ends up wanting to help Jordan expand and promote the book club so that even more people can get into it. I just think that's really sweet. My one issue was that in romance books, there's always a point where things inevitably go bad and throw a wrench in the relationship. And that moment in the story wasn't wholly convincing to me just because there wasn't really any reason for them not to be together. So I wasn't really on board with that. But I will say that the grand gesture in this book is on a whole other level that I've never really seen before in any romance book. And it completely made up for that we can't be together moment. So I really enjoyed this and I gave it a solid four stars. I finished finished off June with some incredible queer manga, the first of which was volume one of Love Me For Who I Am by Konayama Kata. It's a queer manga with a non-binary protagonist, Mogomo, who is openly non-binary, leaning more towards an effeminate style, and one of their classmates, Tetsu, invites them to work at his family's maid cafe for cross-dressing boys. Like many people, Tetsu has made the incorrect assumption that Mogomo is a boy in girls' clothing when they are not. And while Mogomo likes the atmosphere of the cafe, they're not sure if it's the right place for them to be. But when they learn that the cafe is run and staffed by a bunch of queer folks, they come to recognize the cafe as a possibly safe space. Content warnings for some depictions of homophobia and transphobia, as well as some instances of misgendering on the page. This manga is fantastic and it completely took me by surprise. It does such a good job of exploring what it means to be non-binary in such a binary and gendered world, specifically within a society like Japan where gender lines are often blurred in some respects but then simultaneously reinforced in very strict ways. It's a weird place to be in as someone growing up queer because certain things are acceptable in certain spaces but when you're a young student in public in broad daylight, things are very different. Through the lens of this very queer cross-dressing cafe, there is so much nuance in getting to see so many different experiences of gender in one place. There are characters who are queer, trans, and proud otokonokos, which I gather is a term that specifically describes men who adopt feminine modes of expression, but it is not necessarily a reflection of the way they experience sexual orientation or gender. All these different characters are brought together because of this cafe and the way it allows them to express themselves, and no two characters' experiences and experiences expressions are alike. In like less than 200 pages, this story shows us that people in dresses don't always want to be women, people who cross-dress are not always queer, people who are boys don't always default to masculinity, people who are non-binary do not owe you androgyny. These are facts. And Mogomo just got to me because even though our experiences of being non-binary are very different, I understood the way they have to fight the urge to force themselves into certain boxes just to make other people comfortable, or this urge to perform as a certain gender in order to be lovable, which is bullshit. This volume alone confronts how language, labels, and societal expectations are so strictly projected onto trans lives and trans bodies, but Mogomo knows exactly who they are and who they are not. I got so much out of this volume and I cannot wait to continue with this series. I gave this one four and a half stars. And finally, I had to read Given Volume 2 by Kizu Natsuki. This is a queer music manga about this young prolific guitarist Onoyama who comes across this strange, sad, quiet boy named Mafuyu cradling a guitar with broken strings. And in a strange twist of events, not only does Onoyama offer to help restring the guitar, but also to teach Mafuyu about music. Turns out Mafuyu is extremely talented and that everything he's been through has lent itself to making him an incredible lyricist. And it's about these two boys working through their stuff, falling for each other, and making incredible music. Content warnings for allusions to off-the-page domestic and child abuse, and brief mentions of suicide and the related death of a side character. I cannot think about, much less talk about Given without receding deep deep into my feels and getting extremely emotional. The feeling I get when I read and watch Given is unlike anything else, and to me it is just the perfect series. Mafuyu especially is such a beautiful character because he's confronting past trauma, he's coming face to face with grief and loss that he's never allowed himself to feel, and all of that bleeds over into how he thinks about and creates music. This entire series is about how music is a vehicle for connection and emotion, and how music in its purest form Form is a kind of release. And the way Unoyama perfectly compliments Mafuyu as a friend, a mentor, a partner, a musician just gets me because their relationship is really giving Mafuyu a new context through which to navigate all these things. The way Unoyama can create the perfect underlying music to carry Mafuyu's lyrics is really just the perfect metaphor for this relationship, and I cannot 
talk about it. I can't even get to the end of that sentence. It's beautiful. It's heart-wrenching. The music element is divine, but there's still room for humor and lightness and hopefulness. I cannot talk about this anymore, but clearly I gave this one five stars. So this has taken an embarrassing amount of time to film, but those are all the books I read in the month of June. As always, if you read any of these books yourself, or if you would like to read them in the future, I would love to know what you think of them in the comments below. But that's everything I had for this wrap up today. Until next time, educate yourself, be kind to yourself, take care of yourself, and I will catch you on the flip side of the page.